Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here tonight, firstly, because my parents fell into the evolutionary trap that is love. But I'm also here tonight to dissect it. You know that feeling when you're with that special person and um, the whole world sort of stops for a second. Time stands still when you gaze into their eyes and you're just wrapped in bliss. Everything's perfect and really you feel as if you're in a Nicholas Sparks movie. Yeah, that never happened to me. But back in my old primary school in Hong Kong, I read this story and it goes like this. Junyu, the goddess of weaving, came to the mortal realm and met a cow herder named Nyolong. Now, the two fell in love, got married, and eventually had two children. But when Junyu's mother, the queen mother of heaven, found out about the news, she was furious and decided to take her daughter back to heaven. As you can guess, Nyolong was devastated. He then rescued a god who repaid him by flying him to heaven. But he was eventually stopped again by the mother who created a river of stars that separated the two lovers. Thousands of magpies later on heard the cries of the lovers and basically decided that every year on the 14th of February, they would form a bridge where the two lovers could meet. Obstacles after obstacles, the lovers never gave up on seeing each other, even if only for a day. People around the world love, no matter where you're from or when you were born. People write and create books, poems, myths, songs, and art about love. I mean, most of us here crave love and affection, so much so that some of us would even die and kill for love. As magical and passionate love can be, is it really anything more than just a chemical reaction to trick us into maintaining a positive genetic variation in our population? And for the parents in the room, you've probably had to explain love to your child or children at some stage. Now, can I just get a show of hands from people that just absolutely do not believe that love um, isn't a chemical reaction? Like you believe in true love, you know? Okay, oh, this is so sweet, okay. Um, um, I'm probably a bit too young to be educating a room, not full of adults, a room full of um, people on love. But um, in terms of science, I'll definitely give it a go. A while ago, in 2005, researcher Helen Fisher took 2,500 MRI images of people holding images of their loved ones and basically found out that their brains were active in regions rich with dopamine which, if you don't know, is the so-called feel-good neurotransmitter. Now, for that picture that says cocaine up there. Unsurprisingly, the brain of a person in love is actually very similar to a person on cocaine. Love acts on the ventral tegmental part of the brain, which is, which is where the blue spot is in that left picture, and the nucleus accumbens. Both are commonly known as the brain's reward circuit. Like cocaine, it lowers the threshold of the reward circuit, which stimulates your pleasure center, which is the prefrontal cortex of the brain. When we actually fall in love, there's a surge of dopamine and norepinephrine, which not only makes love more exciting, but are also responsible for your heightened feelings of elation, immense energy, cravings, and focused attention. Not so sweet after all. Apart from that, and most importantly, I think, we also get a surge of oxytocin by the hypothalamus. In mammals, this neuromodulator is responsible for reinforcing bonding and attachment. <clears throat> 
usually after sex. Now, to put everything into perspective and to sort of support, support the argument a little better, I'm going to read out an extract from one of my favorite poems, The Nymph's Reply to the Shepherd. But could youth last and love still breed? Had joys no date, nor age no need? Then these delights my mind might move to live with thee and be thy love. The poem basically tells us that not even the deepest of love will last. Everything grows with age, even love, which eventually dies. And indeed, many philosophers would agree with this, one of which is Arthur Schopenhauer. In his infamous book, The Metaphysics of Love, he talks about how the only aim of loving someone is to have a child, which is why we're all under this dress of illusion that is love. This is rather heteronormative, but is usually what most people who take a more straightforward or even pessimistic view on love would believe. Okay, after all that, probably wondering at this point when I'm actually going to address my topic or the question head on and sort of give you my own personal spin on the matter. But you see, it's a lot more complicated than that because everything I've said just now proves the people that didn't raise their hand right. That love is a chemical reaction after all. That is a tool to sort of get us to procreate. However, I'm gonna contradict myself by saying this, but I think that was a poor choice of word because it doesn't trick us into procreating, but rather encourages us into procreating. To add to that, I'd like to point out that there is an inherent difference between being in love and actually truly loving someone. Scientifically speaking, the constant craving and desire often lessen after one to two years of being in a relationship as cortisol and serotonin levels return to normal. Love is, after all, an explosion of chemicals that makes people do the crazy things people in love do. But I think that it is what you do with what's left of the explosion that proves you truly love someone. The type of love I'm talking about is called compassionate love, which, I guess, isn't as euphoric, but is far deeper. Everyone, even here, has probably been in love at some stage in their lives. A dating website surveyed around a thousand random people asking when they fell in love for the first time. And 55% of the people answered between the ages of 15 to 18. Now my own personal best guess is that most of that 55% have now ended up with a different person. The feeling of being in love is merely excitement, to quote St. Augustine, a temporary madness. But truly loving someone isn't a feeling. It's a choice to put someone else first, take sacrifice and understanding. I mean, there's a reason why people only say fall in love rather than rise to love. Because loving someone is probably the biggest gamble you'll ever take in your life. Because there's no promulgation of boundless passion and there is no promise that they will do the same for you. Now, back to my point of love being an encouragement to procreate. This is a picture of my parents. They've been married for 23 years now. And like any married couple with a 17-year-old son, we all fight and bicker a lot, especially at this quite sticky age. <clears throat> but we have never to this day, well, I have never to this day, stopped loving them. <clears throat> you see, raising a child 
or raising me in modern day society takes a whole lot of work, to say the least. To decide that you actually want a child with someone else is to completely devote yourself into something and have absolute faith that the other person will do the same. I believe that if my parents didn't have me or any children at all, they would probably be a lot happier. But I believe that I have made as much of an impact on their lives as much as they have on mine. Their love has blossomed deeper because of me and will one day live on through me. They have probably understood themselves better because of me. So I guess to explain love through science formulas and philosophies is really just like translating a poem. You sort of fail to capture its essence with numbers and letters. Because I think that love is an abstract idea per se. It demands not to be understood, but simply felt. Therefore, I strongly believe that procreation is just a very, very small part of being in love, but definitely, definitely not its sole purpose, if there even is a purpose at all. Now, to wrap up, I like to end with a quote by Sasha Anand. Thank you. <laughs>